Good morning. I'm Tom Brady, the Associate Dean for the Public Services Division and the Director of the Homeland Security Training Institute here at the College of DuPage. I'd like to welcome the attendees joining me here today in the Staff Sergeant Robert J. Miller Homeland Security Education Center, or the HEC as we call it. And I'd like to welcome those people that are watching us live on YouTube as well. 20 years ago tomorrow, the United States suffered the largest terror attack in history when Washington, D.C. and New York City were attacked. Nineteen hijackers commandeered four planes and used them as missiles to destroy our vital infrastructure and our way of life. Another plane was taken down by heroic passengers in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. If you saw the American flags planted on the north side of this building that we're in right now, they represent every person who was killed in the 9-11 terrorist attacks, 2,996 people. This lecture is designed to take you back to New York City in the aftermath of the terrorist attacks which occurred there on September 11, 2001. Dr. Mike Fagel was there at Ground Zero, and he's here now to tell his story. Dr. Fagel's public safety career includes law enforcement, fire rescue, emergency medical services, emergency management, and occupational safety and health. He has served the U.S. Department of Justice and Department of Defense in various capacities, including building a FEMA organization from the ground up in the Middle East. He was a reservist for FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security, responding to such events as the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995, the World Trade Center attacks in 2001, and Hurricane Sandy in New York in 2012. In addition, Mike was a Fusion Center trainer and instructor at Argonne National Laboratory for 17 years. He's published six textbooks on emergency planning, with his fourth book, Crisis Management, earning the Textbook of the Year Award from the American Society of Industrial Security. As a Homeland Security subject matter expert, Mike joined College of DuPage in 2014 to teach within the Homeland Security Training Institute. He's also an instructor at several, several universities, including Northern Illinois University, Illinois Institute of Technology, Louisiana State University, Eastern Kentucky University, and Aurora University. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Mike Fagel. Thank you, Tom. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to share some moments with you as we talk about where we were 20 years ago. Things have changed, but have they? This presentation is going to be something that you're going to find historic, but also emotional. And that's critical for me, because this takes me right back to where we were 20 years ago tomorrow. This question I ask a lot, who here has been in New York City? It's a show of hands. New York City, when I arrived, was totally silent. And these views are mine, not that of, not that of any federal, state, or local agency. As Tom mentioned, some of my background, these are Mike's views, nobody else's. And I know that I will evoke some emotions with you. 
please understand we don't want to hurt anybody, but you may know people that were deeply affected. At the end of the presentation today, you'll have a better understanding of why we do some of these pieces, why we do some of these things. And I want to share with you the credential that I had at Ground Zero. This credential allowed us to access to various points on the site. An important part of the credential was this, the American flag. Times Square, the hustle and bustle was totally silent for weeks and months after the attacks. Today it's getting noisier again, but at that moment, listen carefully. calendar on September 10th, how the world changed on September 11th. George Johnson, Danny Williams, and Billy Eisenbren put that flag up when Chief Crother said, let's hoist a flag. These images are iconic to me. And I will tell you that I see these images every day. And again, this is what I saw. And I will tell you that this is not going to be about the operations of Ground Zero. That's a whole other talk. This is about what we did and the emotions and things that we did while we were on the scene. And I will tell you, one of the most important things was a letter I received from the chief of department, Chief Charlie Blake, sent this letter a year later. And the letter says, in essence, that we were a team. And let me read to you. You de demonstrate an outstanding ability to decipher complicated city, state, and federal health and safety rules and recommendations to accomplish their important tasks, health and safety of our World Trade Center Task Force members. Finally, you were a great friend, truly compassionate professional, whose concern for those of us suffering the physical and emotional trauma from the loss of many close friends and loved ones was evident in your everyday dealings with all of us, uniformed and civilian. That was critical. This is very important to me. This is on my desk. I see this every single day. We're going to talk about what those 100 days were like. Every day was different. No moment was the same. Everything changed on a second by second basis. And I carried a log book. Every day, this log book, and there's five of these, was what we did 
moment to moment. The handwriting of the notes of the meetings and the elements we went to, it really brings me right back to those 20 years ago. And 1993 was the first World Trade Center attack. It happened in February. The trial of that assailant is ongoing or is going to start pretty soon. But eight years later was the next attack. And with that attack, some people at World Trade made their safety plans better and stronger. And they learned from that event. Rick Rascola, a British citizen and American citizen, a member of the military, saved almost 3,000 lives by helping people escape from the Morgan Stanley Building, which you will see right here. Rick perished. He was a true professional, member of our military, safety and security manager for the office. He was the hero that day. The weapons, as Tom mentioned at the opening, aircraft uses weapons and it changed the way all of us fly today. It changed everything we've done from September 11th on. And three aircraft as weapons. The heroic passengers and crew that brought the plane down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, that may have been aimed for the Capitol or the White House. Can you imagine the terror in the minds of the passengers of those aircraft? Let's never forget them. But we have, and that's the sad part. America has forgotten. The tears of 9-11 have dried up. Take a look at this quick timeline and you will see how the aircraft came in. When I saw the first aircraft hit, I thought, terrible accident. But then moments later, when the second weapon hit the building, we knew that the world had changed dramatically. Take a look at this photograph, or this depiction. You will see how far the aircraft penetrated into the building. You see the picture on the right, the north and south towers. And I arrived at Ground Zero on the 18th, one of the first commercial flights that went back in the air. When I got there, I looked up and down, left and right, north, south, east, west, and I can still see it today. I can still feel it today. And it was surreal. It was surreal. Let's take a look at some of my first impressions. I want to share with you some things I saw. To and see I will that tell in you. the air, it was absolutely appalling. And you could see the smoke billowing up from the site. Having been in New York before, it was an ungodly sight to see. And it was a gut-wrenching, very, very sad occasion to see that. Some of the first impressions was, was that it was surreal. He was absolutely unable to, to grasp everything that we truly were seeing. I actually spent a few moments standing in one spot looking at every scene I could think of. I just stood in one spot and looked left, right, up, down, east, west, and tried to capture as much as I could and, and soak it in, knowing that I wouldn't have any more time to look. I had to start working right away. The site was almost like a movie set. It was foggy, smoky, it was raining, the fires were burning, sirens were wailing in the background. It was overwhelming. 
And if you remember Dante's Inferno's description, this is exactly what that must have looked like because it looked as if it was never going to stop. Some of the thoughts were, where do we start? What do we do first? What do we do next? What are we going to need to support this mission? How long will we, will we be here? And we didn't know what we were going to be doing that day. These are some first handwritten notes from the wall when I was at the command post. Personal protective equipment, masks, gloves, benzene, what was going on. There was a lot happening and it was changing second by second. We talked about fire suppression. Remember, New York City still needed to have a functioning fire operation, even though Pete Gancy, the chief of department, was killed. Ironically, three weeks before, Pete Gancy, the fire chief, myself, and Ed Plogger, the fire chief of Arlington County, Virginia, who wound up finding the Pentagon fire, three of us were on stage at the International Association of Fire Chiefs getting awards for service to the community. Ironically, three weeks later, Pete's dead. Ed's finding the Pentagon fire. And a colleague of mine from Oklahoma City bombing, John Hansen, the fire chief of that mission, called me to say, what can he do to help? It was absolutely surreal. This wasn't the first event I've been to. April 19th, 1995, Oklahoma City bombing. 168 people were killed. Hurricanes, Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Floyd, Oklahoma City tornadoes. And when you talk about emotions, during the Oklahoma City tornadoes, I recall going door to door looking for victims. I had a FEMA vehicle. In my vehicle, I had food, water, teddy bears. Out of the rubble comes a small door opening and a small child opens the door and comes out of a storm shelter. I hand her a teddy bear. This is Chappie from COD, but Chappie wasn't with me. But I hand her a teddy bear, so you thought that I'd given her a giant bowl of candy, uh, food, water, whatever it was. That's what we have to do is we try to make a difference in society, is help people one person at a time. That has stuck with me. And I will tell you that today, 16 years after Hurricane Katrina, there's hundreds of thousands of people without power in Louisiana, Hurricane Ida. Almost 40 people were killed in New York, New Jersey from flooding. So let's think about them as well. They may not be in the headlines, but think about those who need our help. I showed you the journals, and these journals, again, stuck with me. Just a random page. This is October 10th. I have not seen a lot of these pages in 20 years. Talk about Department of Health. Talks about safety programs. How do we make people follow safety rules? I'll submit to you that no matter what, if we suggest people wear masks, we suggest people wear gloves, helmets, and things like that, people in general rather not be told what to do. Look at us today. We're trying to keep firefighters in masks and gear and a lot of them wanted no part of that. To this day, many people have become ill from ground zero illnesses. Ten years after my deployment, I was diagnosed with kidney cancer. I have a lung disorder and some other fun stuff, but I'm alive. 
knock on simulated wood, I am still here. I'm going to do this as long as I can because it's important to get this message out. That safety of everybody is critically important. I read you that letter from Chief Blaitch, and I, I have to tell you, to me, very important. And as Tom told you, I've worn a lot of uniforms for a lot of different agencies. Heaviest item I've ever worn weighed almost a million pounds putting on this vest of a safety officer at ground zero. The weight on your shoulders as a safety officer is immense. And this is, this is a clean vest. We weren't allowed to bring anything contaminated home. But our vests, our helmets, our boots, our gloves were decimated. And so were our masks, so were our filters. This is the heaviest thing I've ever had to wear. Think about it. Safety is everybody's job. We all talk about it. But do we? Wearing our masks. Wearing our seat belts. Doing things we know is the right thing to do. But some people rather not be told what to do. I created a group of friends on scene next to me in the left-hand picture of the gentleman in the white helmet. It's Fire Chief Charlie Blaitch, third in command of the fire department. Remember, 343 firefighters lost their lives. 67 police officers lost their lives. 3,000 civilians lost their lives. The gentleman in the next picture behind me, it's, uh, next to me, it's Lee Morris. Lee was a chief's aide, and we became the three musketeers. We talked all the time. Our days never stopped, and we did whatever we could to make the mission move forward. I'll tell you about this trailer in just a minute. Let's see this next video. The attacks of September 11, 2001, caused the greatest structural disaster in history. The catastrophe claimed nearly 3,000 lives wiping out 16 acres of downtown Manhattan and 15 million square feet of office space. The disaster left almost 2 million tons of rubble to be cleaned out, requiring over 60,000 truckloads and eight months of around-the-clock work. The collapse of the World Trade Towers also left one of the world's worst environmental calamities. With deadly toxins, including asbestos in the dusty air, Ground Zero became not only the largest, but perhaps the most dangerous work site in history. Hot steel, gas cylinders, an unstable debris pile, cranes crowded together and swinging overhead, smoke rising from fire still burning deep underground, partially collapsed high rises leaning precariously on other smoking buildings. If you take a look at the maps behind me and Draw your attention to the screen to my left. See the smoke? I want you to see the smoke. I want you to smell like a motor burning, like a clutch burning. The fires burned for over 100 days. And this pallor you see never disappeared. It was in three states. If you take a look at the map again to my left, you will see the river. You will see right here in the center the ground zero footprint, 16 acres. And then you'll see the green buildings around it. These are buildings that were searched, may have been partially collapsed, but required a tremendous amount of search and recovery. It was one of the most dangerous work sites in history. I still think it is to this day. One of my missions, Chief Blaitch came to me one evening, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and said, Hey, Fagel, you're the safety officer. What do you mean? As we knew, 10 of 15 safety officers were killed when the buildings collapsed from every division, every battalion. 
And I was part of a team. It wasn't about Mike. It was about all of us. Building a safety plan that could be used by multiple organizations. It took almost a month to get everybody to sign off on it. And we had 15 signatures. One signature was missing. The plan never went into effect. And the signature that was missing was the city of New York's legal department. You may draw your own conclusions from that. We pushed a plan forward, tried to get it signed off. And because it wasn't signed off, it was not doctrine. And that was an issue 20 years ago. Perhaps today as you develop your emergency plans, your crisis management operations, make sure legal counsel gets involved with you at that very moment. So they're part of the plan from the very beginning. It took eight months to clear the debris. And people to this day are still finding debris and artifacts in some places. We had fires that burned for over 100 days. Fires burned out of control. We had Freon in the basements of the buildings from the refrigeration equipment. Freon, when it burns, creates phosgene gas. Phosgene creates death. I remember calling colleagues here back home in Illinois. I called colleagues from Aurora Fire, uh, King County Sheriff. People who I knew and trusted said, I need your advice on something. They said, why are you calling us? You taught us. My mind was so foggy from the things that we'd run into that I needed someone to say, do A, then B, then C, then D. Take a look at these photographic images. This is a 60-day image of the fires burning in the basement. And remember, technology was much, much different than we have today. We had backhoes, loaders, dump trucks. And think of all those people who've never been to a disaster. Bulldozer operators, crane operators, truck drivers, all these folks in their normal walk of life, and then they're in, installed on this scene that was living, breathing, moving. It was an angry sight. And as one of my departed colleagues, Chase, said in one of the other videos that we did together, the sight was angry, and it will continue killing and eating people. Chase perished. Raul perished, people that I worked with, colleagues of mine, from their ground zero illnesses. The logbook. We're talking about a slurry wall. There was a wall in the Deutsche Bank building that may have collapsed. They had to bring in thousands of yards of material and dump trucks to try and fill that up so the wall wouldn't collapse and fill the entire site and flood it. We had 36 cranes on a 16-acre site moving and, and spinning. And I will tell you, 36 cranes was an unbelievable number moving on a very small site. Here is a piece of vellum drafting paper that was on our wall. Very tough to see. But if you look at it closely, you will see some very faint circles. Each of these circles is a crane swing, a crane boom. This hung on our wall. We're trying to figure out how do we keep people from getting in trouble? Because every construction operation wanted to get everything done as quickly and as expeditiously as possible. These things have been in a box in my basement at our home that need to be shared. These need to be out. These need to be put someplace where people can learn from them. They don't do any good in 20 boxes in my basement. Picture 33 to 36 cranes working on a 16 acre site. Normally, under a normal construction operation, you'd have one or two cranes. Here you had multiple booms, multiple arc swings, multiple areas where they were all interacting. All things that you would see in a normal event, but here we had it multiplied times four. If you look through the logbooks, and I, I, again, I brought a lot of logbooks with me. 
In the log books, again, this is what we did moment to moment. We had a crack in the slurry wall that we were worried about. The slurry wall, that's S-L-U-R-R-Y, we were worried that that was on reclaimed land. A lot of buildings in that part of the Manhattan were on earth that had been brought in, and it used to be a, uh, a waterfront. We're worried that if that gave way, we would absolutely lose the entire site, and we would drown people immediately, which was something we certainly didn't want to have happened. So there were concurrent operations moving at every moment. When I say there was 50, 100 things going on at once, I'm not exaggerating, and that was just in our shop. Walking working surfaces changed every moment. If you took out a piece of steel from one site, if a crane or a backhoe lifted something out, someplace further down, something would shift and move. And when that shifted and moved, something a thousand feet away may collapse. And every movement had an action and a reaction. If you ever remember playing a game as a child called pickup sticks, where you moved one item and something would come apart, that's what it was like. Every movement had another reaction. And that was something that we really had to be cautious of. Fall protection, uh, slipping, moving, uh, it, was, it was a sight that was just unimaginable. I remember a, a gentleman right next to the trailer. Remember I showed you a picture of that red trailer? That trailer was a blue trailer the day before. We needed a red trailer for our fire department command post. I had one of my colleagues lift it up with a crane, take one of the 10 trailers that were painted blue that said police on it, move it on site, drop it down, paint it red, put a decal on it. The next day, the police never knew what happened to him. Well, there was a gentleman who sat outside that trailer, Captain Charlie Vigari. He sat there every single day and said, find my boys. He lost a son in the police department and a son in the fire department. He sat in a card chair outside, and he never went in. We invited him into the trailer. He was a former fire captain. Would you like some water, sir? I'm not moving until you find my boys. I can see that. He never left the site. He wouldn't come inside. He would occasionally accept a bottle of water from us. But he was trying to make sure that we didn't forget his boys. And I will tell you, take a look at this list of organizations. This is just a mere sample. There were hundreds and hundreds more agencies that were there. You will see fire, police, emergency medical services, public service. And you'll see patches from two of my units. I was a member at the time of the North Aurora, Illinois Fire Department. I was a member of the Kane County, Illinois Sheriff's Department. I put these patches in because this is part of my history. This is what I learned. This is what I did. And it didn't matter what patch was on your sleeve or what was on your uniform. It mattered what was in your heart. Take a look at the steel being cut right there. Look at the size of the beams, and then look at the fuel trailer you see down there. We were worried that they were going to be bringing in fuel apparatus and tank trucks and trailers. That Could they be bombs? The answer is yes. We didn't know where or when the next attack was coming. I showed you this photo off to my left, and look at the gaping hole. Look at this crater where thousands of lives were snuffed out. Not only the command staff of the fire department and command staff of police operations, but there were 3,000 civilians. And at the time, people thought, because this is at 9 and 10 o'clock in the morning, 
This could have been 20, 30,000 inhabitants in the building at that moment. Remember, there was a subway station going underneath it. Uh, it's a very vibrant city. All these things came to mind. How many people are there? Now, if you take a look, you will see a very faint yellow line. This yellow line shows you, to my left, the footprint of the various buildings. It was not one building. It was actually eight buildings that were involved, five collapsed. The Emergency Operations Center building that was in parts of Building 5 and parts of Building 7 collapsed. And if you look at this picture to my right, this is an example of what was built in 72 hours. This building was an empty shipping pier. And this building was equipped, computerized, cabled to be an emergency operations center in, its, in, in less than three days. Everything was gridded. Grid maps are everywhere. GPS was very limited back then. Our phones were limited. I communicated on a sky pager, text, and Blackberry was my favorite, but this is a Palm Pilot. It should be in the Smithsonian Museum. But this is how we talked. And various other pagers, other devices. We had Nextel phones. I've got one here someplace I'll show you. But we had devices that communication was absolutely goofed up because the telephone building lost over one million telephone lines. And back then, everything was on a hard telephone line. And we were told that we had to do anything we could in our power to get Wall Street back up. So that next Monday morning, Wall Street was back up on the air. And I will tell you that we violated darn near every OSHA rule you could think of. We had heavy, wet cables stretched on the ground. We had cables strung on forklifts. We used forklifts as our, as our towers. We pre pretty much violated everything we could. We had satellite trucks. We did everything we could to get Wall Street back up, and it was, because that economic engine had to run. Take a look at the red line. You'll see area of items buried in steel, buried in steel so deep that every time you had to take a crane or a bucket to lift it up, something else moved someplace else. We found people, body parts, victims, gear. I recall on the site over on Vesey Street, I found a clipboard. Clipboard said Jack Fanning. I found it. I carried it with me. I gave it to Chief Blades. I said, I found Jack's clipboard. Jack and I were on several hazmat committees together, and we had spoken about a week prior on some joint projects. Ironic that I found his clipboard at the debris pile. I knew Jack was there someplace. It's not about ever forgetting. And sadly, I, I think we have. I remember this. This hangs over my desk. Don't forget. Don't forget why we do what we do. If you look closely at this photograph, the yellow, red, and blue arrows are people, victims. To my left, these are public safety personnel. The blue, civilians, equipment, apparatus. Look at these vehicles. Look at this equipment. These are people. Tom had thousands of flags planted out front. 
Those are people. People that are forgotten. And we can't. Safety was a 24-7 operation. It never stopped. And look at the noise. Hear the noise in this picture. The cutting of the steel. The smoke. The pallor. Feel that. We had hazardous materials. We had free, and as I said before, the military brought a robot in to try and find the product. We tried to make sure we could eliminate another hazard before it became something else. We were trying to mitigate something before it became another, another crisis. And every single moment, the perimeters of the buildings changed. This perimeter, this map kept moving. It was a living, breathing thing. It did not stop. And everybody was storing material, storing their fuel, their cylinders, their gases, their hoses in various spots. And it was difficult. We had to make sure that we had people not smoke, eat, or drink on site. But they did. People grab a bottle of water. Who knows what debris was on that bottle top? Who knows what was on their hands? People want a candy bar, or, or they would smoke, or they would bring something to their face. We said, you've got to wash your hands, and telling a firefighter to wash your hands is a very difficult task because nobody wanted to take the time because they were looking for their colleagues. We had to make sure that we washed the vehicles down because as the vehicles left the sites, they were off, dust was rolling off and debris was rolling off. And you see in this picture, people are uh, tarping it and perhaps cutting other debris. And during these operations, we had people who were uh, very cautious about what they were hauling away. We had some vehicles that had false bottoms. Back in the early part, people were being paid by the truckload. And if they had a false bottom that was yay high, full of rebar, and they would put material inside, it was only half a truckload, and they still got paid for truck after truck. Yes, during a disaster, people will try and do things that are ugly and most likely against many rules. You'll see in this picture a green zone. Inside this green zone is what the Department of Health said is where you must wear your personal protective equipment. But we found out that wasn't actually true. While we're taking air samples and OSHA and EPA were taking samples, and I have many colleagues at OSHA that were there. We were training and helping them understand how to work a disaster site. If we would have said that you must not leave the site with a mask without a mask on for three states, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, can you imagine what that would have been to the public? So they made a zone. It was a political zone versus a scientific zone. Remember, politics always out trumps science and logic. That's something that I learned the hard way. Logistical issues. We had people bringing us materials. So as a young firefighter, I remember we used folding tanks called pumpkins. They're orange folding tanks. Some of the firefighters on the scene said, we need pumpkins. Someone misunderstood that. It was October. And what did we get the next day? A semi-trailer load of pumpkins, gourds, jack-o'-lanterns. Be careful what you ask for. So make sure that your messages are clear and that you ask for the right equipment. Logistics, if you look at the picture, which would be the magnetic board, to my left. This is how they kept track of staff when they were deployed. This is in a battalion chief's vehicle. These magnets were all destroyed. They lost who was where. Every member of station 10 and 10 was killed. So was sevens where we were at. Everybody lost somebody. We slept on the hospital ship U.S. Comfort. 
and it was a respite. It was a bunk that was two feet wide by two feet tall. It wasn't a love boat, but we got hot meals. We got medical care. We got uh, a place away from the noise. Not really. The noise never stopped. You could hear the bulldozers, the cranes, the jackhammers. And the circle you see at the bottom of this slide, it says fatigue. Looking at the look in people's eyes, the forlorn deer in the headlights look, people were absolutely running on empty. And that was a concern. This photograph, uh, myself in the middle, gentleman in the white shirt, that's Chief Charlie Blach. Lee Morris, we were the three musketeers or two musketeers. We had all sorts of things um, that we think about them today. It was amazing. We did a lot of things. And I talked to Charlie on a regular basis. Lee, I talked to him at least once a month. Lee and I talked like two older folks that haven't seen each other for a hundred years. We'll talk for an hour and a half about nothing, about everything. But that's important. This photograph shows some people who've perished. And to my left, Zach Goldfarb, chief of paramedics. He survived. Mary, his aide, their vehicle was crushed in the collapse of Tower 2. Mary has since passed away from Ground Zero. That's Mary right there. There's Johnny. Al, Dave, Bill's passed away, New York Fire. Jim Cooney, I'll tell you about Jim Cooney in just a minute. There's Fire Commissioner in the middle, there's Randy. Everybody has a story to tell. And let's not forget the people who perished. Every day, we never said goodbye. We said, I'll see you later. Because we never wanted to say, I'll never see you again. The days morphed into weeks and months. I came home for three days in October. And I was met as I came off the plane by a reporter from ABC7, Leah Hope. She chased me down the hallway, because remember back then, anybody could get in the, in the hallways of the airports, get right to the gates. She finally stopped, or finally asked me to stop and talk to me for a few minutes. I wanted to get home. I wanted to see my family. Let's take a look at this. This is an 18 inch between floors. Look at this video with me. These are 18 inches between floors. Where in one building you could actually see 18 to 19 inches between floors, where that was all that was there. Fagel relates a frightening moment, which still gives him nightmares. We were underneath a building doing a recon with some of the chiefs looking for uh, safety operations. It was pitch black, we were working our way through, and it was dark. All of a sudden, we heard a rumbling overhead. We saw dust start to shake. We saw daylight start to peek through, which was something we weren't aware of or weren't expecting to see. We took off at a pretty good clip when this happened, hoping that this is not going to be the last run we'd ever make. What actually happened was overhead a particular piece of heavy equipment was in the wrong position. Every day we built, we developed what they call incident action plan. The IAP said who's going to be doing what, where, and when. Everything was gridded. Everything was in a grid map. This particular crane, instead of being in section 101, he was in section 401 where we were at. When he put his outriggers out and dropped his boom, his boom legs down, he about brought the ceiling down on us. Everybody has to make sure that they follow the plan. And we tried very hard to keep people on track. I talk about the smoke and the smell, the sights, the sounds. If I tell you the sound was deafening, 
of the silence. Think of the noise that New York City had from the hustle and bustle that had disappeared. And the smoke was everywhere. I recall a day when I had been at the command post and Charlie said, take some time off. I was trying to walk back to the ship. Traffic wasn't working very well. I wound up walking from the site up to Columbus Circle, which was three miles away, four miles away. I was wearing uniform, I was wearing ID, and a police officer came and said, hey buddy, are you lost? And I said to him, where am I? And he said, come on, sit down. And uh, took me over to the precinct station and we chatted and talked and I got a ride back to the ship. But for a moment, I didn't know where I was at. As I get older, that happens more often, but then it shouldn't have. I was 49 years old. I shouldn't be losing my thoughts, but it did. And I recall that when I came home in October, I was, one of my trips I was picked up at the airport by the head of our critical incident stress team, our Northern Illinois critical incident stress team, which I've been a member for over 25 years. He picked me up and took me right to a class. And I looked disheveled, discombobulated, and it was at a, at a, a mental health facility where the class was at. Someone actually thought that I was an innie versus an Audi and that I needed help, and I really did. And I will tell you this, mental health is absolutely critically important. Mental health is not mental illness. People are afraid of getting mental health. Don't. Don't be afraid of asking for help. If we break an arm, we go see a doctor. If you, your heart, soul doesn't work, mental health, reach out. But people in our business, fire, police, EMS, we're afraid to ask for mental health because it's viewed as weak. It's got to stop. We've got to no longer put that stigma of mental health being an issue because every one of us is human and we've got to not forget that. As soon as we do, we've lost the battle. To this day when I see scenes and I look at photographs, I see the sight, to this day I can still smell the smoke, see the billowing of dust. I can still feel the heat. I can still see the looks and the faces of the people, the victims, the rescuers. And that will never, ever go away. I still see crews of fire people lined up on each side of a Stokes basket, helping to pass out the remains of somebody, a fallen comrade, under a flag-draped stretcher. Will we ever be the same again? And the answer to that is no. The world we know from September 11th is a totally different world. It would be safe to say I haven't slept since September 11th. And that's true. My wife Patricia is here. Thank you for being here. Sleeping is something that's highly overrated. I wish I could. In the audience, my brother, Chief Greg Benson. Greg and I talk every day. We talk about how to get through some of these things and how to keep going. Some days I want to stop. Some days I just want to stop. Here's a clip of an email. Remember 20 years ago, emails were not that common. Uh, emails, this one, this particular email, on the way home. A couple days off in the middle, I think. How you describe, it's been an honor, honor to work in New York City. On my lapel is a Ground Zero Task Force pin given to me by Chief Blach. It's an honor to have this on today. And I have this in a shadow box 
I'll pass this around the room if anybody would like to take a look at it so people could see what's inside. But these pins are what we wore, what we got afterwards. It's critically important to remember how we got here. I saw items from people I knew. I found Jack's clipboard. I should have inventoried it, GPSed it, barcoded it right there on the spot, but I didn't. I carried it with me and didn't return it. I gave it to the Chief Blake and said, Chief, here's Jack's clipboard. I found it over in Sector XYZ. I'm sure I violated, some, violated several evidence and rules. We have memorial services every single day. The police department, fire department lost many members and they were burying artifacts or empty caskets. People wanted closure. To this day, at the World Trade Center Museum at the site of Tower 1 and Tower 2, there is a medical examiner's officer there 24 hours a day, seven days a week because that scene is still a crime scene. They have never ever left the scene. There are still 1,100 people unidentified. I remember, I remember I showed you a picture of a big gentleman, Jim Cooney, big bear of a man. What a interesting fellow. We're walking underneath building five. He says, stop. Moment of silence. We go, uh-oh. Hats off. Usually that's when we found a person. And what it was? Krispy Kreme Donut Factory. I love Krispy Kreme, as you can tell. I never met a donut I didn't like. But we had humor that was a little bit dark. In our business, do we have weird humor? Yeah. Do we? Is that a way we cope? Yes. I recall when we were going to lunch one day, one of my colleagues kept asking for, we go to the McDonald's tent, he kept asking for a Whopper, which is a different brand. One day I went to the tent a bit of time minutes before him, gave him a, a Whopper wrapper and a, a Burger King, uh, King's crown, and said, when Lee gets here, hand this to him. So here we were at a McDonald's site, in the middle of the mischief and mayhem, they hand him a Hamburger with a Whopper wrapper on it and a Burger King crown. Seems very silly, but for those five minutes, people had a chance to go, wow, we are still human. You must communicate. If we don't communicate, we will make the same mistakes over and over again. Was life simpler with just a text pager? I don't know. Do we spend so much time on the phones and I'm guilty of that? I wish I had a way to triage the 200 different emails I get in a day and the gazillions of texts. It's tough. We've got to learn to do that. I've got to be better at it because it can consume you. You've got to share information though. Information sharing is key. If your agency knows something Another agency needs to know. You've got to share it versus saying, mine, I'm not sharing it with you. Because if we don't share data, it's just stuff in a drawer. And we've got to do that. It's got to be teamwork. You've got to eliminate the turf battles, the politics, and the egos. Because all those three things, as you see on this coin, we have politics, egos, and turf, P-E-T that goof up any mission, any place, any time, anywhere. And as we showed you the patch, it doesn't matter what patch you wear. It matters what you're trying to do. It matters what you're trying to do inside your own organization, in your heart, in your own shop, in what you're trying to accomplish. Because when something happens, the public expects that of us. They demand that of us. 
and we've got to make sure that we do what we're supposed to do. Communications, be it a next telephone, a pager. We made reports. Our reports had reports. Our meetings had meetings. You've got to communicate. Photograph you see is this photograph here of one of the command posts that were built. That was at Pier 92. This picture has some members of my group. There's Ed Wallace down there with NYPD at the very lower left, Cobra unit. Friends I've made, lifelong friends. Ed and I teach together. Let's take a look at sharing. Teaching. Training. Educating. That's our mission here at COD. Train, educate, teach, and share. Because if we keep it tucked away in our and we don't share it, other people can't learn from the things that we've done. What was the age of the child that drew this picture? Look at this crayon drawing. Three years old, four years old, five years old. What is going through the mind of that person at that time? Out on the table uh, behind us, out in the foyer, we have um, some handwritten drawings from kids that I've kept. And they were in those cardboard boxes till Amy came and went through my basement. And we found stuff that I hadn't seen in 20 years. I'd like to make sure that this material that we get winds up in a spot here at COD where people can learn from it and see it. But you need to listen. You need to learn. We need to make sure that we can hear everybody and everything. Remember, when you see these images, these are people. These are moms and dads and sisters and brothers and aunts and uncles. These aren't statistics. These are people. When I hear this, it gives me chills, as it does you, I'm sure. I'm part of the World Trade Center medical program. I'm alive. <laughs> but my, my, many of my friends have perished. Teach, share, Educate, train, help people who come behind us. Be prepared for what's ahead of us. I have no idea what's coming next, but something is coming next. Don't sweat the small stuff. Little things make a difference. What did giving that teddy bear to that small little girl at the Oklahoma Tornadoes do? Did that change her world a little bit just for a moment? Yes. Remember our families? Look at those people you haven't spoken to for a while. I recall as a young sheriff's deputy, I was on a Christmas Eve call went to a house where a father and son were fighting and arguing and they hadn't talked and I walked in and said guys some people don't have a father or a son to talk to let's get your differences away and start talking I said if I have to come back here I don't want to but somebody's going to spend the night in the uh, Gray Bar Hotel 
hour later, we got a, I got a page to call the office. Hey, were you on that Smith call? Because back then we didn't have cell phones. Yes, sir. The father just called and said, oh, I'm in trouble now. He said, thank you. He and his son sat down and talked for two hours. So you've got to make a difference. You've got to try and make a difference. Take those steps. Eternal vigilance is the price of freedom. And remember, America lives in each one of us. Be safe. Be kind. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. Tom has something for you. Come on up. Tom, I'd like to present you with a Ground Zero flag. Each of us were given flags when we left. We got a flag a week. I was there for many weeks. I got a lot of flags. This is for your museum. We need to start a museum. Please display this with honor, and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fagel. Really appreciate it. Thank you. That is certainly uh, something that we'll treasure. And, you know, we had a couple of questions, Dr. Fagel, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. Uh, we want to get your, your thoughts on a couple of things that came in during the uh, presentation. So, and, I, and I'm, I'm interested to hear your... <clears throat> your feedback on these things because of your experience and, and all the teaching that you do. Um, one of the questions that came in is, says, what do you think is the biggest thing we learned in this country from 9-11-01? To train together better, to make sure that our agencies, our organizations, again, regardless of the patch, to train better together and become part of a cohesive unit. If we don't train together, we don't work together well. Well said. Thank you for that. Another question that came in uh, says, you mentioned that you feel we may have somewhat forgotten 9-11-01. What do you feel we need to do to never forget and keep the memory of those that died alive better? Well, Tom, programs such as this, I believe, go a long way. But this is just once a year. We can't ever forget. And we've got to train and we've got to inspire people why we do these things. And let me pass behind you, sir. I want to hand you something else. Another item for your, for your museum is never forget. This is for your museum. Remembering September 11th, 2001 because we forget all the time. And it is critical that as we think of how we better prepare, this needs a prominent space so we never forget. So this is for you, sir. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Oh, well, that's wonderful. And well said. 
The, the last question that came in that I want to uh, get your thoughts on, do you feel that the United States, United States is safer in 2021 than we were in 2001? Well, sir, that's a very loaded question. Every news reporter asks me that same question, and I always suggest that we are getting better today than we were yesterday. We're always learning. We have to be right 100% of the time. The bad guys only have to be right once. We have to continue learning, training, and preparing day by day together. Thank you. Please, let's hear it one more time for Dr. Mike Fagel. What an extraordinary presentation. Thank you for your, your personal insight, your experience, and your leadership. It, it's very much appreciated, Dr. Fagel. I want to make mention that tomorrow, the College of DuPage presents 9-11, 20 years later, our community remembers. Right here in the mock courtroom in the HEC. We're fortunate to have Dr. Fagel will be joining us again tomorrow morning for our, our, our memorial. Um, and will also be streamed live on Facebook. Please join us as we remember and reflect on the devastating attacks on our country 20 years ago tomorrow. The memorial will begin at 7.30 a.m. and is available on the COD Facebook page. Thank you for attending today's presentation. Stay safe. And in the words of Dr. Fagel, we will never forget. Thank you. <laughs>